Okay, welcome everybody. Good morning. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'm Neil Ward. I'm based at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, and I'm one of the co-leads of the AFN Network Plus. Um, and I work with my colleague, Jess Fredenberg, who, um, and together we help run the webinar series. Um, AFN stands for Agri-Food for Net Zero. And so the network is all about uh, focusing on the UK agri-food system and identifying and tackling barriers to transitioning to a net zero UK by 2050. Uh, we're funded by UKRI, which is the umbrella body for the British Research Councils, and uh, we're running up until the end of 2025 in the first instance, and we were launched um, autumn 2022, so just over a year old. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, what, what we've called the elephant in the room. Um, the fact that discussions about transforming the agri-food system feels often as if it's largely an occupation pursued by salaried middle-class uh, professional people. Uh, we often talk about a just transition, but uh, where are the voices of the people um, who are living in poverty and, and insecurity in, in this debate? Um, Poverty and insecurity is not just a concern that comes from one place on the political spectrum. It comes from all sorts of um, areas across politics. And we decided on this topic a couple of weeks ago, but this Sunday, front page of the Sunday Times, the lead story was about a report from the Centre for Social Justice, which is the centre-right think tank that was established by Ian Duncan Smith, which talks about... Um, the UK uh, risk of slipping back into Victorian era levels of inequality between the middle class on one hand and, quote, a depressed and po poverty stricken underclass um, on the other hand. And last week, we also had a UNICEF report, uh, which reported that the UK ranked worst amongst the world's leading nations in terms of levels of child poverty. So this is an issue uh, across the political spectrum. It's an issue that's being acknowledged um, by external independent agencies as well. Uh, and so I think it's quite timely that, um, that, that, we, that, that we chose to pursue this um, in a bit of detail in a, in a webinar. Our speaker today is uh, Dominic Waters. We're very pleased to have Dominic with us. He's going to speak about his own experience of uh, living in poverty in, in uh, today's Britain, uh, as well as his experience of engaging uh, in debates about the food system and transforming the food system and, and, and that, that sort of experience and, and the barriers that he's, he's faced. Dominic is also known as Single Dad SW, or is it Single Dad Social Work, uh, on Twitter. Uh, he's a single dad living on a council estate in southeast England. He's also a campaigner and speaker and uh, an author of a book published in 2021 called Social Distance in Social Work, COVID Capsule One. Uh, he works as a Food Foundation ambassador, and he sits on the board of the British Journal of Social Work, which is published by Oxford University Press. Um, I'll hand over to Dominic uh, in, in a second to present. If you have any questions for Dominic as we go through, it's the, it's the usual approach. Put them in the chat um, or in the Q&A section, and we'll try and sort of curate those and get through as many of them as we can in, in the discussion. Uh, as we usually do with our webinars, we'll be recording the session and aiming to put it on, on our YouTube channel. We've got about, I think it's 10 or 11 webinars now, so it's quite a resource for people to, to access. If you don't want to be identified as participating, then probably best not, not to ask a question. Um, so, okay, without any further ado, over to you, Dominic. Thanks very much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you, Neil, and the AFN Network. It's an honour to have the opportunity to share with you today and to be here. So I'm grateful. Uh, thank you also for the intro. And just to say a bit, just to say a little bit more about me. So um, as noted, I'm a single dad. Me and my amazing daughter, we live in the most deprived uh, blocks of my council estate. We've survive off um, free school meal vouchers, universal credit, and we've always had uh, pay-as-you-go gas and electric uh, meters. So what 
in considering today and um, the kind of new new ways of thinking that I wanted to discuss, I wanted to, I'm going to include parts of my story as I think like my very existence in this space speaks to the challenges of properly addressing these issues. Going to look at hidden inequalities, food and fuel deserts, um, the idea or concept of lived experience and what I um, developed from that, uh, the concept of living experience, indigenous knowledge, and really it's going to all focus around how we, the, the, the agendas of net zero and how we can really bring about transformation to the food system. So that's me and my daughter in front of um, where we live. And the estate where I live in, the shop on the estate, it only sells like the lowest quality of food produce and there's nothing fresh. So ironically, perhaps it's a food desert in the Garden of England. And I really saw during, during times of working with children in care, how their lack of access to nutrition really mirrored that um, of the lack of access to nutrition uh, me and my daughter experienced, and especially during the COVID lockdown restrictions and seeing how um, some of my neighbours may be less, uh, less mobile than I am. And so because of our environment, the, the lack of access to nutrition was really highlighted. Also, and to, and to speak to the fact that food insecurity doesn't exist in isolation, and that the the shop on the estate, you can't top up your gas and electric. So it's also a fuel desert and the interconnectedness of having um, enough gas or electric to cook your food, uh, I hope, I hope is uh, obvious here. I wouldn't, before, before really why I put Marcus Rashford and salute to Marcus Rashford for all the important and vital work he did is prior to him, someone of his caliber speaking up, I would never speak about uh, my gas and electric being on emergency, my cooker that's from the local homeless charity, my even my furniture um, and the you know the bins that don't get collected and the black mold all up and down the block i wouldn't speak about these things to anyone outside of my council estate and that was and that's mainly due to the the shame and the snobbery that ex exists in our society so it was really it really took the work of marcus rashford um to to put put the idea of food insecurity on the on the kind of political agenda. Uh, but Marcus Rashford was more talking about food poverty and I'll get onto that, onto the distinction um, between what what uh, poverty, uh, food poverty and food insecurity is. So yeah, to give a little bit of insight and this is back to the beginning of kind of COVID times when I was studying my, my the I the university I was at, um, I was experiencing acute food insecurity. There were days where my daughter could eat and I'd just have her leftovers, if anything. I was also facing homelessness because um, getting notices, seeking possession of my um, of our council flat because of wrongfully uh, incurred rent arrears, which also shows how food insecurity doesn't exist in isolation. It's often coupled with other um, inequalities. But I was at my university, I I've focused my dissertation on the role of food insecurity in, in the social work domain. And I also was um, seeking for some financial support. Now, I only say this for illustrative purposes, but the university, it was a very intrusive process and it didn't um, it didn't come out to any financial support. But the same university now has a food bank and the same university now has a you know, right to food campaign. And I and I just think it it's I hope it's OK to share and not to be taken as critical, but more as a kind of open reflection that that it's only now that these discussions have moved 
to to an to I guess mechanisms of support when you know the poor have been in a cost of living crisis long before um, the phrase was popularized, and it's it's now we're kind of it's getting this element of institutional focus. So just to 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 kind of demonstrate how my voice started getting heard, I was being asked to um, right, I, I got asked to feature at one um, webinar and some of the stuff I said about, you know, um, food insecurity being integral to to how we move forward in in uh, various professions, but in particular social work, I was getting asked to um, write some blogs or feature to speak about um, or be a voice for people living in poverty. I won't go through all of them. And my my voice seemed to resonate and the inequalities that I discussed seemed to, um, people seemed to, yeah, it resonated with, with people and it picked up some momentum. And I, I used every opportunity I got to speak up for people that are often unheard. And I was, I was being asked to write about my lived experience of council estates or my speak about my lived experience of food in this insecurity or my lived experience of fuel poverty or my lived experience of being a single dad. And I'd be so grateful and I'd be sitting writing or thinking of things I could say, but I, I, I would sit here and I'd, and I'd realize that this isn't my lived experience. This is what I'm currently living. And so in my book, I developed this idea from lived to living experience, which is really to highlight that these inequalities are not a, a thing of the past, but even more than that, to, to underline the, the tensions and the, the insecurities that exist and that these shouldn't be comfortable conversations. It shouldn't be that organizations can bring out their person with lived experience of this inequality and then send them on their way. The, these are might have to be uncomfortable conversations, but this isn't a complete, these inequalities are still very prevalent as um, Neil suggested in the intro with the CSJ study. So yeah, and my book is on Amazon. So if anyone wants to um, go and check that out, it would help me um, survive and get out of the slum. But in that, in that, um, in the book, I also it's the first time I believe anyone in this country has write, written about food insecurity and children in care, which I'm happy to take any questions on later on. But I know time's short, so I from from the the concept of living experience that I developed, I also we're aware of the FAO, uh, the UN definition of food insecurity, which is you know is very competent and obviously and covers covers a lot of elements but i i refined the idea of food insecurity to the living experience of food poverty food poverty being what marcus rashford spoke about and you know the it being an economical issue and the lack of um tins you might have in your cupboard if you're lucky enough to have a cupboard but i moved it to the living experience of that food poverty to demonstrate how it impacts on your whole well-being, your and your ability to engage in society, and how food insecurity can um, can can make you unable to yeah to function, and can also make some of the already most disadvantaged families in our society have additional challenges and not be able to flourish briefly and I could do like whole presentations probably on each of these slides so I am I am kind of whizzing through but I've also developed a, a framework to help people understand the the levels I see it, of um, issues around access to food and access to nutrition and so food poverty as I just noted with what Marcus Rashford um, helpfully and courageously discussed and it being an economic and around scarcity of access to food, then food insecurity, as I've uh, defined it as the living experience of food poverty, um, as more around the the impact this lack of nutrition can have on your physical and emotional well-being. 
I should say that I've kind of done it. I'm sure the audience are aware, and I hope I'm not jumping too fast and around. But so food poverty being very much on the micro, the micro level, and then um, food insecurity being more on the communal and the border, the border impacts of that. And then food, as I phrase it, food inequality is the more the macro, the the systemic, and looking at calling it what it is. It is an unequal distribution of resources that isn't experienced in isolation. As I highlighted, um, facing homelessness, um, you, you know, the gas and electric being on emergency, the windows that don't uh, close, and trying to and the kind of disregard that you are met when you raise these issues so anyway i've included this because uh, it's getting published in my next book but um i thought it might be a, a helpful visual for people to kind of um discuss and move from the different levels uh between food inequality so net zero and poverty and i just thought i would i'd put this here to to kind of as a question to consider and ha as we move on, but how can the net zero agenda work to tackle inequality rather than deepening the gaps um, between the have and the have nots? And it's, it's, it's something that is, there's a real urgency and that, that is also echoed through moving from lived to living experience. It's, is to highlight that urgency um, of these inequalities and the need to address them. So I'm lucky enough to uh, to get invited to different events and to be part of some different forums and brush shoulders with some, you know, politicians or people, decision makers and, um, and I get brought out to speak about how, you know, the the daily realities of poverty and provide insights to to individuals and organisations with power. But I think I'm gonna, I, and I hope you can stay with me here. But to bring about transformation is going to need institutional planning and process, and. And bringing out a, a voice of lived experience, and I, I hope the, um, the the image does this a little bit of justice, but to bring out a voice of living experience to provide those vital insights and, you know, and this is not trying to be negative, this can ignite change and be a catalyst for change, the, those insights, but then to send them on their way and let the, the big boys and the big girls um, look at like the, the, implications for policy is is uh, how would i is is far from truly inclusive so i think although this like ad hoc inclusion can be a catalyst for change of a voice of poverty i think it's about research and institutions looking at how they can build a sustained and sustainable relationships with living experience and how that that knowledge exchange can be one that is mutually beneficial and mutually um valued i'm really notice, noticing time so i'm gonna I, i'm gonna go as quick as i can but so as i said i'm i'm grateful and lucky enough to sometimes get to speak up for people like my neighbors that are often unheard and some who've uh, kind of given up on engaging in broader society. But one, one um, recent, quite recent um, uh, forum I was lucky enough to talk at, and it has happened in the media as well, I believe. I, I won't mention any um, media stations or TV channels, but I get, I get asked, and it's phrased in this way, is is how how are things for people from your world and it kind of it's only more recently that i've reflected on that and it sat with me and i've sorry i've sat with that and it really speaks to this idea that we aren't together and this isn't this 
you know, your existence is very separate and, you know, we, we will bring you out to provide these insights and then send you on your way, as I've highlighted. But I hope we can move towards through through this work, more towards uh, our world understanding, because, you know, for example, what happens in Mayfair impacts on what happens in London Road Estate, where I'm speaking to you from. And kind of, I think it will be of value to understand that interconnectedness moving forward to bring around uh, transformation. And I'll quickly say in just a month ago, uh, I was, I was, uh, brilliantly invited to and pay, sponsored to go to Canada and work with First Nation Indigenous communities out there. And please do look up the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation. Um, they're doing amazing work for the marginalised communities out there. Um, and I saw how that First Nation communities, the the marginalization and the inequalities they experience on reservations or living in poverty are, are very much mirrored by the poverty that exists and the inequalities that we experience in the, that the poor experience in this country. And I'm just, a lot more obviously could be said, but I'm just noting this to say that to kind of be, be mindful of a global understanding around um, poverty and marginalization. And then I re very recently was asked to speak at the Unlock Net Zero event in East London. And so, oh, and I will say, so in terms of the knowledge and indigenous knowledge from, sorry, I'm rushing, but from Canada is around how it's often not valued and how their, 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 that the way it's not valued mirrors that of the snobbery that I speak about and experience in this country, but how uh, there's they speak about it. So this is not just me saying it, but how the hierarchy of need, I forget who, um, who is it Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of need that actually was taken from Blackfoot, who's um, was in Canada and it's and it and that is a demonstration directly of how indigenous knowledge hasn't been valued or more recognized or, or acknowledged and it's the same i've had with challenges around people giving me credit for the definitions or concepts that i've developed and then just on not being able to to speak is so when i was at this very recent event unlock net zero I'm, I've, I finally find my way through the Excel Center and I'm going to, the, I get directed to the stage and mic'd up and I notice that the event, um, it's Homes UK and they, they dealt with me brilliantly. So thank you to them. But the event, the stage that I was speaking at was sponsored by Mears. And that, it, 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 it put me in an awkward position because Mears, are the the company that the council employ to make um, repairs to this whole council estate and many many other council estates um, across this area. So I and I was asked questions around what can be done and I had to be very mindful, even though I was transparent about this, because I wanted to get invited back um, to this opportunity about that a voice of poverty doesn't have in a, a lot of spaces have the freedom to be truly open and truly critical because of that that dynamic that is often um at play i hope i i hope um that can be understood so i thought about um transforming the food system and with the net zero agenda and I'm hoping that I've kind of touched on and I'm I'm willing to share some more, you know, daily reality insights, but I'm hoping that I've addressed some of the kind of bigger issues about engaging with living experience and how 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 can a transformation um to a food system without voices of lived and living experience truly be a transformation? And I would suggest it couldn't. And so it would be great if this, if I could use this space to invite people to consider how 
that engagement and acknowledgement could could be progressed. Yeah, um, I think I will leave it there. But to to the there is such insight. So I just I I say that you know I know um, professors of well being that didn't know what free school meal were prior to COVID. What you know what does that say? I I personally because I. Uh, I guess my my very existence moves between these your world and our world um, dynamics. But I know um, people who are on the news, heads of NGOs, talking about um, poverty that didn't that three years ago didn't know what um, a pay as you go or they called it prepay gas and electric meter. And I think that this knowledge exchange to have people from a position like mine to have a space to learn from the voices and knowledge that um, academics and leaders in the field provide, but also that kind of mutual, that mutual um, knowledge exchange is going to be, uh, I would politely suggest, a key part of of moving forward with sustainable um, change and making a, a discourse that is is inclusive in this area, and it can can inform us moving forward. Uh, I'll just say that as someone on currently on sanctions of universal credit, that it's, it's a dehumanizing system. It doesn't give, um, as is more being spoken about now, but my first line in my book is, is around this very issue of universal credit. You have to have um, internet access to do it. A lot of my neighbor, neighbors are in digital poverty. So it's it's also just the amount that is provided is um, not enough to, to guarantee the essentials. The great work of, I think it's CPAG and the um, Joseph Roundtree Foundation, they've done studies on this. But I think, yeah, to, to, to leave it on that, I think to bring around transformation of the way we we approach our food system and the way we're looking to to meet new measures, I think to bring around true transformation, you need voices um, of lived and live experience integral to all the work we do. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Dominic. And um, you've kept time very very well there, much more disciplined than um, when I gave a talk on the webinar a few weeks back. So th thanks very much. Um, we've got some questions coming through already, so I'll I'll um, I'll put some of these to you and see what your thoughts are, and just invite everyone to um, uh, to, to contribute with with more questions as well. Um, Dominic, first one: um, yeah. Have you had any experience with co-creation projects? Um, um, do you have any thoughts on when they work and when they don't to bring about systemic change? So I guess this might be stuff in your local area, or it might be stuff you've encountered through some of your engagements in these these meetings and conferences and things. Um, but uh, is that something you've come across, co-creation projects, and do you get a sense of them working well or, or not? I've come across co-creation, co-design, um, participation-led, and um co-produced and yeah i think these are these are useful and some of the projects i've seen have have resulted in some good outcomes i would personally say that i haven't i i've found it's more a level of a voice of poverty of someone who with my voice is not it's like you're only included to a certain level in these forums and and it's not your, your your voice isn't isn't meant to impact on like bigger levels of um poverty and oh, sorry policy and then it's like you're sent back on your way and I'm um, go back to my council estate not knowing how I'm going to feed my daughter not knowing how I'm going to pay the rent but so I uh, so to answer that it, I would say that I've found and I can only talk to my experience especially in the social work space but in other um, professions and academia that I, I had to create that book with that no funding facing homelessness 
the books, not to speak down about it, but it doesn't even have page numbers and it's now in university libraries up and down the country. So small victories, but um, I had to create that to kind of give my voice a validation. And I, I invited other leading practitioners and professionals in the field to contribute little articles to the book. And so it was really to create a platform where a voice like mine could be could be heard and um, it, the value in 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 what is said recognized. I think there are probably probably uh, good ways of moving forward with co-production, and perhaps it actually points to or speaks to this the the idea I'm suggesting here around real transformation. Um, with living experience being integral to um, how we can how we continue with this work, but it will. It, I think the co the co design has to be at that in, um, institutional level, not just on on um, on just a research project level. I don't know if I'm if I'm expressing that well. Yeah, I, I mean, can, can you? Do you have any sense of sort of examples of good practice when 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 researchers or or others are sort of working and trying to be inclusive and trying to include the experience of people uh, living in poverty? You know what what sorts of questions should they be asking of themselves, or what sorts of things should they be doing to ensure that their practices are sort of meaningful and they're being effective? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm mindful of like being invited back and and getting continued um, work, so I don't want to be overly critical. But I, I'm, and it's unfortunate that what's popping to my mind is kind of ways of maybe things that could be done better, and I hope it can be received in this way. But I know that um, there were there were certain. Okay, so there were certain there were there were ethical considerations, and it would take a long time to to unpack that. But to give it a bit of um, body is that there's been a recent study done about the area I live in, poverty in the area I live in, and it doesn't even mention my estate. So that to me that already already um, shows a kind of uh, uh, distance between between the actual environment and reality. But it does speak to um, work people managing the food bank. And so then it's for them to give, they've given a voice to and to the, the inequalities experience, but there's still that gap between kind of direct, um, a direct, way of us being heard but there does need to be sensitivity around that because i i so it yeah did did i think it'd be around developing a kind of terms of reference if it hasn't been done already but having having the voice of lived and living experience integral to how that's developed because there's been lots of times where some of the questions that you can get asked is around you know, so what did you feed your daughter or what did you buy from the shop or how did you feed your son today? Because, you know, journalists might be think that's interesting or researchers. And and it's like, you, you know, you're not you're not in a zoo just getting just I don't know, you, you know, a guinea pig to kind of give give insight. And then and then, you know, as I kind of stated, then the people with with the power can or with influence can disseminate and and discuss it needs to be a two way dialogue where i think involvement is is present at every stage so if that's a bit of a long answer <laughs> yeah no that's that's fine um thank you for that dominic Neil, um, got lots of yes right can i just interrupt there's somebody asking in the chat if we can um stop the um sharing of shot yeah stop sharing of screen so we can see you a little bit better so, okay awesome thank you um but there's so many questions coming through i'm not sure quite where to start um 
just to just to just because I can speak to poverty um, yeah. and other inequalities, but I think it, I kind of I, I, I take this opportunity to say that we we have we have a sense of being let down by society. We have a sense of of being slighted. We have a sense of hopelessness, um, and and the the obstacles that are placed within our way can can destroy our aspirations and our horizons on a daily basis. When you you're you know, I hear my neighbours talking about spending all day on the bus just to get um, special the best deals on microwave meals. Um, talking about washing their clothes less a month so they can save five pound on their electric, or you know the 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 clubs that their kids can't attend because of financial um, limitations, and I think that to engage with and and to conduct research with from from a position from a position of an advantage really needs to needs to have an understanding of of how it is for vulnerable um low income or lower class people yeah yeah there's a question from um uh, someone who's who's remained anonymous but it's about um the role of consumers who experience poverty in, in, in this question of a sort of just transition. It says a lot of the time, ethical consumption or sustainable consumption is a narrative and approach by people who can choose to live in a particular way to bring about net zero. So just, uh, I'd be really interested in your thoughts on this. This is something we did we did talk a little bit about um, when um, get, getting ready for the webinar that uh, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the stuff on sustainable or ethical food, um, seems to be conducted by people who who have the option um, or the capacity to choose food that might cost a bit more. Uh, yeah. I just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. Often single parent families in council estates don't enjoy that sort of safety net or that margin. And and it has been noted to me how, you know, with with achieving the net zero agenda and um and food transformation, food system transformation, that there's this kind of given that food is going to cost more um, and be more kind of localized. And I was thinking about this and there is, there is like a mile and a half away, there is a farmer's market um, that, that, you know, stocks fresh, um, it, which is the direct um, opposite of the shop in the estate, but how, that a lot of my a lot of poor people and a lot of my neighbors wouldn't even if we could enjoy that food we wouldn't have enough gas to cook it from scratch so you can really see how uh, that's why i noted the kind of microwave meals is that that is often how poor people are having to uh who are having to to um exist because you know, we're pay as you go gas and electric like all my neighbours. So you can see how much it's costing you and the small margins you have uh, uh, make make you have to be very aware and alert to to the price of, of each meal. So I think there is a bit of a disconnect that kind of runs through a lot of these discussions, hence why I've kind of used this space to highlight the importance of moving forward with with um work to include voices of living experience but um yeah the it is a scary that it is scary to that that is so broadly accepted um that food will be costing more and like we can't afford the food at the at the, at the current prices which i think have gone up you know, forty three percent, I think, in the last yeah. year. Yeah. And also with free school meal vouchers, so we get the you know because of the great work of Marcus Rashford, you you get well my local authority is even worse. You only get like two pounds a day 
for your so like ten pounds to for your a voucher that Marcus Rashford campaigned for to feed your daughter or your son for that that holiday week, and you know what you could afford for three pounds at the beginning of COVID is a lot less than you can afford, you know, food you can afford now. And the fact that that isn't being discussed and the the NGOs in this space are, you know, going for this free school meals for all children. Well, some of the most disadvantaged children currently can't um, even have a, have a healthy meal on the amount that's being provided. But because voices of living experience aren't often heard in these spaces, this is a less discussed, um, Hardship. Yeah. I mean, th th this issue uh, links to a, a question from Emma in the in the Q&A, which is about, she says, something that strikes me is that I feel we silo the real issue, the economics of deep inequality in this country, into separate issues, food poverty, fuel poverty, child poverty. Uh, I would like to know how Dominic feels about the notion that the actual issue is a politics of dehumanizing competitive liberal individualism. Uh, and what we need before any food climate transition is democratic socialism. So, she, so what she's saying there is, uh, I guess, um, th th these become th there's a risk that they become quite neat niche issues and separate from what she sees as a fundamental sort of uh, structural issue in society, which which she articulates as a you know as a as a political. Um, a political issue and a political challenge, but it's certainly an economic structural issue as well. Um, in other words, food poverty, fuel poverty. I, I, I guess with your um, with your energy payments, you're probably paying more for your energy than people 100%. in big houses that have a direct debit and and all of that. Um, so, how, how, what do you think about that idea that um, there's a risk around these things being too too compartmentalised and separate from a a rather sort of fundamental structural issue. Yeah, I think I, I would I would agree, um, and I think there's a yeah there's a risk of kind of buzz terms and and things getting attention that that of yeah that are too compartmentalized as you suggested. That this is why I'm really mindful, and I hope the person can can see or in the future see that this is why I try and always call it what it is. So I've developed a, a first of its training um, that has just come out yesterday, actually, to try and influence the way um, people working with the most disadvantaged families in our society have an understanding around um, that engagement and approaches. But it's around, I think it is, yeah, calling it what it is, that it is a poverty and it is an inequality. So I call it poverty aware practice or poverty aware and food insecurity training module. Um, yeah, and if anyone want, wants to contact me for information around that training, please do. I think, yeah, I, I, I would say yes. And it's also that it's been uncool or unpopular in professional spaces as far as as far as my experience in previous years to to talk about poverty it wasn't really the it, it's all no I wouldn't say I'll say it's a, getting a lot more focus in in the past three years than I've ever experienced in in my life and that although welcome it to me it goes back to how that participation or co-design is is going to be um progress yeah yeah um there's loads and loads of good questions coming through and i'm sure we're not going to get through them all in the next 12 minutes so uh i'm i'm we're going to have to pick and and choose um but we can we can um we can keep them all so at least you can see the things that uh, people have been asking um thank you Dominic. everyone for your engagement it's really encouraging that um, I, I don't know, it's probably not all positive, but that it's at least starting these discussions. And um, yeah, like, thank you for, for it. Here's one from Ruth, um, who works for an international development NGO, uh, comes up against the challenge of the importance of cheap food to help people living in poverty when we when we talk about net zero. Um, when we, uh, and also when we talk about the right to food and food sovereignty and anything else that would shift power 
to, uh, to the agricultural communities that, um, that, that she works with. So interested to hear your thoughts on the notion of cheap food in the UK and the need for cheap food. OK, so and, and I, I hope I'm not going to, you know, go. I'm just offering a reflection if it doesn't fully answer the question. I apologize. But it's interesting because thinking about that. Right, so the shop on the estate and, you know, I hope they still serve me if they were to see this. But um, it stocks the lowest quality of food, but it's not the cheapest. So there, there is there is an argument that. You, you you could get fresh um fresh produce at, at the same um at the same cost or maybe less but then it's about access and lack of access and also that interconnectedness between food um lack of access or food insecurity and um the cost of fuel which then also goes to speak to the failures of of the welfare system. So, and so the cheap food is is in in my experience. I'm, I don't know why I'm so careful to kind of say that, but in my estate, the cheap food isn't nutritional of of nutritional value, and it and it shows. And I hope it's okay to highlight how you know, the poor are. Are the health inequalities that the poor um, often have to experience, and that differentiation between the the affluent areas in in the city where I am, they, you know, there's at least a ten year um, differentiation between life expectancy, and I think there's broader work on this, and I should be more knowledgeable, but I don't have it in front of me right now. So I think those. I think people have pointed to that these health inequalities, the kind of pending hit that this is going to have in in years to come on on the impacts of poverty and food insecurity on the poor, that will then be passed on to perhaps the NHS. And so, I, I would hope that um, that we can kind of have a shared a shared desire to to tackle these. Here's quite a crisp um, question, Dominic. How much do you think people who have never experienced poverty can ever truly understand what is important to prioritise, even if voices of poor people are invited to speak? I don't think... I, I, I don't think they can, and I don't want to get emotional, but it's i don't think they can i think there are there's obviously there's levels of understanding that can be achieved but uh, and i wrote about it and i hope it's okay to say that sir michael marmot quoted this and it was in a piece i wrote and i said that being poor and living with these insecurities is I get the same feeling that people get when they leave their keys or the phone or their phone on a train and then you get off and you're and it's gone and you've got that you've got that uncertainty and and it's but it's like that constantly and it has to be your overriding focus especially when you have sole um responsibility for a child so and I and I I could get a lot deeper into now the interconnectedness with my work and social work and how I've influenced policy in that space. But yeah, I don't think you can truly understand. And I, I, I hope that that image or that scenario can can be understood. But if you can remember the last time you left your train on your phone on a train or your house keys. And then the not knowing of how you're going to get into your house, that that whole uncertainty and insecurity that that comes from that, that is what it's like living in poverty. Yeah. An an another crisp one here, um, Dominic. Other than raising incomes from work and benefits, which is surely the most obvious solution, it says in brackets, uh, what do you think could make access to food and living experience of food more equal? I think there's there's two things going on there. You know, what sorts of initiatives might help, but really isn't this basically an issue of 
um, resources and the benefit system and and um, and work and pay and levels of pay. Yeah, I think yeah, you probably covered covered it there, but it's also yeah, community resources are are obviously of value and much 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 needed and there there are questions why they 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 are so needed and increasingly needed um in 2023 but yeah i think you've yeah i think you've covered it really yeah and um, there's lots of um lots of comments and questions um people being really appreciative of the of the talk um there's one here I'll just pick up. Awesome. Oh, God. God, I'm just going to say, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking on my feet, guys. So please bear with me. But the lack of acknowledgement in my engagement around, and this is not on all platforms, but I think it's important to highlight around the kind of emotional toll on, on self that it takes to, to. You know, there's nothing more dear to me in this world than my daughter. But for me to, to, and it's only now she's older that I'd speak about these things. And you know, with with the people I've given credit to, but the kind of emotional toll it takes on self to to discuss and to be open to people that you you don't really know about these hardships, and and how si snobbery has silenced me. For even to loved ones, you know, so-called loved ones, family members, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to vocalize um, certain daily realities uh, with, with in front of them because of the fear of uh, shame and snobbery, which is, which is being tackled on a level um, through through these discussions becoming bigger and you know different platforms. But I think it does go. It does go back to that. It's vital that moving forward, I think at, at all stages there is a voice, or hopefully a, a, a couple of voices of people who've actually, actually, um, living that inequality. And I would just say with the also the idea of lived and living, because I I, I sometimes think I give it enough, don't give it enough credit, but. I can provide real insights into um, trying to access and the failures of ben benefit mechanisms and state institutions and 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 free school meals and lots of different things. I'm writing about them, you know, real insights that would might shock people. But how someone who maybe lived in a council estate or grew up on a council estate. 40 years ago and I've often had that from journalists oh I know all about it you know I grew up on a council estate 40 years ago it's not that that isn't a value and that isn't an acknowledged but it's that there are certain insights and knowledge that can can be provided through having that kind of current and um yeah that recent or present um relationship with with the the failings of the system yeah i was looking at another question but it's getting quite close to 11 i think we should probably stop and give give you a break actually dominic um so thanks very much for for your talk i'm putting that together and um and engaging you know so fully with uh the things that people have um, wanted to 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 put to you in the in the chat there's loads that we haven't had time to cover um some people worry no. that we might be what might be exploiting you. Um, so uh, I don't think we'll I don't think we'll engage with that one explicitly in the talk. But I hope we can hope we can reassure them that we're doing our best not to. Um, what I just say on that is that, and I'm I'm so grateful for this platform because it has been it's it's been the way I've been um, included and given this opportunity is is around participate true participation and i can't express that um more thoroughly than what well, i can but it is i'm really grateful and i've been treated really well and it's and it's about this kind of knowledge exchange on on a you know 
however equal that that can be and if it's okay to say i've got a concept and a campaign food is care which we're working and really need some support trying to create it into a company um or a chick if anyone can help and yeah i'm on twitter and linkedin if anyone um is interested and we've put the links up in the chat there dominic but probably twitter's the best way to access your camp your campaigns as well so people can if yeah, they want to do more they can get involved that way yeah, great. And you were a big help a couple of weeks ago when we had a a, a, a network um, meeting in, in London to think about research priorities, and uh, it was a really helpful contribution. So we, we appreciate your help with that as well. Um, I should probably wind up. It's uh, 10.59. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining. It's been a really um, big turnout today, uh, really important uh, subject area, and uh, uh, I hope you agree, re really insightful and stimulating um, talk. I hope that's given everyone some good food for thought. Uh, our next webinar will be in January, I think on the 17th, and that's going to be with Pete Falloon from the Met Office, uh, who is going to talk about climate adaptation in the food system um, and the potential to create win-wins and, and thinking about trade-offs. So if you look out, we'll be advertising that shortly. And you can look at our back catalogue on YouTube. There's quite a pile of webinars uh, accumulating there. And uh, we're quite happy to have comments and suggestions from um, participants about other topics or speakers that we should think about for future webinars. So um, at 11 o'clock, I think we should wind up. Thanks again. Thanks very much, Dominic, uh, for, for all Thank you've you done for us. And, um, we'll speak again soon. And um, thanks very much, everyone else. And uh, hope you have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Thanks, Dominic.